Good morning. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out to church this morning. Um, if you're visiting for the first time, welcome. Um, we're so glad you're here. Uh, we have a welcome bag for you in the lobby. Um, also, please fill out a con uh, connect card in the pews and drop it in the offering plate so that uh, somebody here from the church can get a hold of you. For anybody who is interested, um, we need some help with VBS still. Um, it starts next Sunday, the 11th. Um, there are volunteer sheets uh, out in the lobby if you'd like to sign up. Huh? I said empty volunteer sheets. Yeah. Empty volunteer sheets, I'm being told by my, by my aunt. Um, so if you are interested, please sign up. If you have nieces, um, children, grandchildren, neighbors that you would like to sign up their children to come, um, there are enrollment forms out there as well. Um, and a reminder, next week is the all-church picnic. There will be no services here at the church. We will be setting up for Bible school. Um, we will be down at Little Chickies Park um, on the other side of Mount Joy. And that is it. If you'd all like to uh, bow your heads, please, for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, uh, on this, the 4th of July, when we remember and we thank you that we live in a, in a country where that is free, that we can come here to church and worship you without fear of anything. Um, we just want to take this moment to remember that even longer ago than that, you came to save us from ourselves. Um, Lord, thank you for coming and saving us all from our sin and allowing all of us to be born here where we are free to worship you where, when, and how we choose. Um, we thank you for all things, and in your most holy name we pray, amen. Um, Keith? Well, good morning. We're going to ask that all of our boys and girls come up front and have a seat here. Sure. Well, this is a good crew today, isn't it? So I have a question I need to ask you. I need to ask, who is eight years old? I'm older. Okay, I just need to know who's eight. Eight, eight you're eight? You're eight. Tell me your name. Bryn and Markley. Markley. Come up here, Bryn and Markley, just for a second. So today we're going to be talking about somebody in the Bible who was eight years old and had a real important position. So I thought maybe I would give you an important position today. <laughs> Are you afraid? Well, see, Pastor Keith, See, raise your hand. You know Pastor Keith. That's our youth pastor. He, he was going to preach today, but he's not feeling well. So I was going to ask one of you if you would like to preach. Nope. No? You know, I'll tell you what. I'll even give you my Bible. And you can preach from it. I can't read that good, please. You can't read that good. Hold on. <laughs> You do have a Bible, though. Okay. Well, I wanted to point you guys out because who we're going to talk about this morning was only eight years old and had a real important position. I'm going to let Pastor Keith preach, though, okay? So, I know, he's not real happy. You cannot read. Will you guys go ahead and have a seat? I want to talk to you this morning about our word, and then we're going to talk to you about our Bible story. So let's go through our fruit of the Spirit. We say them every week together. Here we go. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That was not very good. You can do better in that. Come on, there's a bunch of you this week. So I want to hear you yell. I, shh. Nothing from here today. Just our kids. Are you ready? Real loud. Here we go. Ready? From the top. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That was much, much better. Much better. 
So today we're talking about goodness. And when we talk about goodness, the Bible says God, I like this saying, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. It's a great saying. And it is. Everything that God, God does is good. God never does anything evil. He always what he does is good. He always has a purpose behind everything that he does. Psalms 34, 8 says, taste and see God is good. That's our verse. Taste and see God is good. Let's say that together. Here we go. Taste and see God is good. Very good. So... Explain. Explain. How are we supposed to taste it? So, let's talk. So when you eat something, you taste it, and it's what? Yummy. It's yummy. Yummy. So we can't really taste God, can we? No. No, 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 no. So the word taste, though, and this means, like, I can see God doing good things. And so, like, if God... When the God made the sun rise today, that was a what? Good thing. Good thing, yeah. And today, the sky is beautiful blue. That's a what? That's a good thing. Good thing. So we can see that, and in the Bible, it uses the same thing as taste. It means we get to experience it. He'll look it up later, kids. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to experience it, is what it's saying. So we get to experience all the good things that God does. So, Galatians 6, 9, let us, now, not us not grow tired of doing good things. So, I have a question. What are some good things? What are some good things that we can do? Well, so we could help our parents. We could help our parents, yes. We could clean up our things. We could clean up our things. Very good. We can clean our room and make our bed. Make our bed. These are all good things. So if, if you get up in the morning and you don't make your bed or you leave your room a mess, is that a good thing? No. No, no that's an evil thing, isn't it? So, <laughs> sinful. <laughs> Sorry for all those adults who didn't make your bed today. Now you know that's an evil thing. <laughs> so... When we don't listen to our moms and dads, is that a good thing or an evil thing? An evil thing. Evil thing, right. If, we, if we're in school and we're, and we're taking a spelling test and we get a hard word like the word no. Oh, that's easy. Wait, the no as in, like the no as in I know something. Like no, like the word no, I'm not going to do this. And oh, so you, you're, you're, you're taking that spelling test and you write the word N, but you can't think of what the next letter is, and you think, oh, the little girl next to me knows, and you look on her paper, is that good or evil? Evil. That's right. That's right. So, God wants us to always do what's good, but it's hard. It's hard. Only really God is the only good person. He is perfect. But we do have a story today about an eight-year-old boy and his grandfather, Manassas, and his father, Amon, they were evil kings. But this little boy was eight years old when he became a king. Listen, a boy named Josiah became the king of Judah when he was only eight years old. Just the age of you girls, he was eight years old. Josiah loved God. Many bad kings had ruled before him. That was his grandfather and his father. The temple in Jerusalem had started to crumble. People had not worshipped there for many years. King Josiah decided to fix it up. He wanted his people to worship God in the temple. So King Josiah hired workers to repair it. One day, as the men were working, a priest found an old book in the wall. The priest showed the book to the king. I brought an old book today. I don't, it wasn't like this book. This book is all falling apart. But that's probably, it was probably an old, old book like this. But they found this book. And it was a book that was really important. It was all the books of the law. It was the book of the law. King Josiah called everyone together. Then he re read them God's law. 
The people all made a promise to each other and to God, we will always obey God's law. So Josiah became king when he was how old? Eight. Eight years old. And did he do good things or evil things? Good. Good. He is a good illustration of goodness. And that's what we need to do. We need to do goodness. When our parents ask us to do things, we should what? Do them. Right. We should always listen. So our word for today is what? Goodness. Let's say it. Our word for today is what? Goodness. Goodness. And goodness is doing what's right. Goodness is doing what's right. So we have some things for you to pick up here. So you can come by. There's two different sheets today for you to work on. And some cookies. So come on up. And you go sit with your parents. And we'll dismiss you a little bit later for junior church. Okay. pastor and a bunch of kids. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to sing a, a song for you guys, and then I'll invite you to stand and sing with me uh, for a worship medley. After they're done. I know. Who's the screecher? That's probably one of them. I'm probably going to name the screecher. a lot. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do. Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is.
Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. can stand up and join us as we sing a, a, a worship, uh, uh, worthy of worship medley together.
be seated. I believe there's now a 4th of July video.
If you all want to rise, we are now going to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. We are going to sing our prayer together. Um, we're going to be singing God Bless America, and in, in that the words are, that's our solemn prayer, and it certainly is. So listen to the words as you sing. Free. 
Let's pray. Lord, we again thank you for all the things that we forget to say thank you for. Um, when we look around at this country of ours, it's a mess sometimes, and yet it's amazing. And you are in charge, you are in control, and we thank you for that. Lord, I thank you also for the, the tithes and the offerings that have been um, dropped in the plates in the back, and I ask that you use these in the best way that you see fit. We always say, even though sometimes we forget to say, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. And those children who are four to seven, you may head out the back. Michaela will meet you out there. Four to seven. And Keith doesn't need any introduction. Well, good morning. good morning. It's great, it's great to, see to see everybody. You look great. Um, there's so much red, white, and blue. I have blue going on, so <laughs> made it. <laughs> um, I hope that everybody has uh, Fourth of July plans happening. I hope that they are wonderful plans. I can't wait to celebrate by blowing things up. It's such a great way to celebrate our freedom. Um, so, man, how to, how to follow all that up. I just love the singing. So good. Thank you, Dave. I lost him. There he is. It's just such a joy to hear him. Um, it's also going to be really hard to follow up since everybody is trying to figure out how to repent from not cleaning their rooms this morning. <laughs> not only that, pastor brought his Bible to church. So uh, I'm not even going to show you mine. I'm going to set this here for a moment. Uh, while we were in the back praying before the service, uh, Bob uh, gave us a little fun fact. Do you guys know who is the one person who didn't, I'm guessing it's only one, who didn't sign the Constitution? Do you got it? Uh, what did I say? Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Thank, thank you. Uh, who's the one person who didn't sign the Declaration of Independence? I didn't. I did, uh, me, 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 I didn't. I'm Spartacus. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, it was, anybody know? Okay, well, I'll answer it. Uh, George Washington. I didn't know either, but George Washington apparently is the one who didn't sign it, it, which is confusing. I guess he was off at war. I don't know why he didn't just e-sign it or zoom in. It's really confusing. So he's a forefather. can't believe it. Then it so also a little fun fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote it, was 33 years old at the time when he wrote it. Um, that's wild. It just completely takes the wind out of my sails. What am I doing? I just feel like I kick rocks all day long. I mean, he's, it's such a beautiful document, and he was 33 years old. Luckily, I'm only 25. I still got my whole life out of me. Um, but this week, I would actually strongly encourage you um, to read that document. I know that many of us don't get together on the 4th of July and read the Declaration of Independence. It is a tedious task. It doesn't take too long. But this week, I read it just because I was curious. Um, it's incredibly inspiring, thinking of the context, but it is also very haunting, thinking of the context. These men were getting together, fighting for freedom, and going against their home country. Um, it's a very fascinating document. I would encourage you all to read it. When you do, make sure you let Mr. Mutterspall know so you can receive credit. All right? So he would greatly appreciate that as well. Um, again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all those who are at home watching. Um, let's pray before we begin. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, this day where we celebrate the freedom that we have. And as that video showed us, uh, Lord, the freedom that we have came at a great cost. Lord, I can't even pretend to understand that cost. Um, uh, I'm not a man who is in the service. I know there are some here that have served, and a lot of us have family members who have served, and some who have uh, laid down their lives so that we might have freedom here. And Lord, we don't even truly understand our freedom until it starts to be pressed. So God, I pray that today we would truly um, celebrate the cost of our freedom, and we would celebrate the freedom that we have. And Lord, ultimately, we would celebrate the freedom that we have in you, which also came at such a great cost. And Lord, um, 
I don't think we'll ever know the cost that you paid. If we could see it today, Lord, it would shake us to the core. So Lord, help us see that this morning. Open our ears, open our hearts to hear your word, to hear your message. Lord, may the words that I speak be your words. Anything that's of me, Lord, just discard it. We love you, Jesus. And we pray this in your beautiful and precious name. Amen. So I brought out this table for a reason, actually. Um, quick question. Are anybody in here, or is anybody in here, a fan of botany? Anybody like gardens? Oh, I see some hands. I see some hands. I see one. I saw one guy, two guys. All right, I was curious. That was a test. Gentlemen, three. I'm impressed. All right, good. Okay, good. I was going to be uh, super embarrassed when I was going to say I was one of the few. I actually don't know too much about gardening. And now that we have a small little plot of land, I'm starting to learn, uh, man, gardening is kind of fun. It's kind of cool to throw seeds in the ground and watch something happen, right? Um, and now that we have a little girl, she kind of forces me, and men, you probably know this, ladies too, when you have a little kid, they just go on the ground and they eat all the dirt, which <laughs> makes you kind of wonder, wonder what that tastes like. It's been a minute. <laughs> so I... <laughs> All right, that was too revealing. I didn't plan on saying that. There's some here if you want to try it. Uh, but I watch her crawl on the ground, and she's like grabbing things, all these little tiny things that, I, that would go unnoticed. I wouldn't look at those things on the ground. I'm too busy doing what I'm doing. But when she's on the ground, it forces me to slow down. So I get down on the ground. I'm looking at all these things, and I'm looking at like the seeds and the dirt and the grass and that very sharp object she shouldn't have, which I chuck into the neighbor's yard. So... This is being recorded. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> let me bring it in. Uh, seeds are a fascinating thing. So I decided to do a little bit of reading on it. And apparently some seeds have a lifespan. Or all, all, I'm sorry, all seeds have a lifespan. Some have longer lifespans than others. And seeds can travel and all this crazy thing. So for example, um, a coconut is a seed. I did not know this. That is a very large seed, which can fall off, roll into the ocean from Africa, and float to the Caribbean and plant itself there. Um, I've never witnessed that, but apparently that's a thing. That is crazy. Um, orchid seeds are super tiny, really, really tiny seeds. Anybody ever see an orchid seed? I didn't until this past week. Um, apparently a million of them can equal the weight of one paperclip. That's cool, man. That's a fun fact. And like, they're, they're just so tiny. Another fun fact, um, let's, let's make a hypothetical. Let's say you buy a house here on Main Street and in your backyard, you have this big giant maple tree and this maple tree just drops a whole bunch of little leaves, those little helicopters. Kids, you know those little helicopters that fall? Okay. Yeah, they're so much fun. You can even peel them and like put them on your nose. It's, a, it's another time. Um, so apparently they can fall down into your gutter and grow little trees, and they can just keep going. Why is there dirt in your gutter? Why is there nourishment offered from the gutter to grow these trees in your gutter? And now you've got to replace your gutter, and your gutter is going to fall down. And Fun facts. Fun facts. I have to clean my gutters. Yeah, that might be from experience. So I brought some seeds, and I just want to, I just want to plant a couple. Actually, oh, I, was, I almost thought there wasn't going to be any seeds here. This is, uh, these are lettuce seeds. I actually need some help. How do you plant lettuce seeds? Anybody know? Do you plant them in a bunch? Yeah, do you know? Do I just drop them in? I sprinkle them? <laughs> All right. I'm going to do that. I'm going to offer some water. This is my offering to you. Grow. All right. Hey, hey, hey. hey. Oh, 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 I'm in trouble. Pastor's watching me. I, this might be my last time up here. Uh, <laughs> all right. Any minute. <sighs> all right. Calm down. Calm down. Big boys don't cry. All right, um, I don't have a month. Okay, I don't want to keep you guys that long. I did pack a lunch. Anybody else pack a lunch? I can wait. Just grow. So 
you're right, man. You are absolutely right. It takes time. But the interesting thing is, we don't like to wait. At least I don't. A lot of the times when I, so I planted some lettuce seeds in my, or we planted some lettuce in our yard. We planted sunflowers. We planted pumpkin and all that fun stuff. And I look at it every day expecting there to be fruit already. Anybody else? Is that, that can't just be me. Like I go outside, I'm like, where's the pumpkin? It's, why do we got to wait until October? Where's the pumpkin? Like, where is the fruit? It takes time. We have to wait. We have to wait patiently. Some seeds wait patiently other than others, and that's great. And a cool thing is, here's how the seed, well, I don't know scientifically, but what I do know is that a seed is planted in the ground, and in order for that seed to give birth to life, it has to die. That seed dies, and it gives birth to something beautiful. It takes time. That seed is going to die. It's going to get nourishment from the soil. It's going to dig roots down deep, and then it's going to grow into something beautiful. So this got me thinking, and I think about this probably more uh, too, too much, especially now that I'm going into the dirt and playing with my little daughter and uh, being fascinated by all these things. Um, it got me thinking about last week, though. Last week, we had baptisms up here, and it's such an awesome thing. Four people were proclaiming that they are identifying, they're professing their faith, that they are identifying with Jesus' death and resurrection. They're letting all of you know you can now keep them accountable. You can now encourage them. You can now come alongside of them as they rest in the hope of Jesus. Such a beautiful thing. And I think of the passage that puzzled me as a young believer before I was baptized. Um, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. It might be on the uh, two slides away there, Zach. Oh, there's a seat. Hey. Um, so John chapter 3. If you want to pull out your Bibles, you can. Uh, Pastor, do you need help with yours? John chapter 3. No, you got it? You got it? You're good? All right. Um, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And it'll be up on the screen if you need it. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came, to, he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him very naturally, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. I think of this passage, and I, I do want to look at the Spirit of God for a moment. Because what ends up happening in the life of a believer, and we've talked about this many times, especially when I've been up here, I've talked about this. When someone encounters Jesus, they now receive God's spirit and their old self dies and their new, their new life begins, really. And that's what Jesus is talking about, this new birth. Um, <clears throat> thinking of a random memory. Uh, when Vicky and I, when we lived in Uganda, they, uh, if you were born again, you were someone called a saved, or they would say saved. That's how they would say it. And if you were someone who was saved or born again, um, it meant something different than a Christian or something different than just someone who goes to church. And I wonder what it, that would look like if that were here, if that were true here in America. Uh, a lot of people say they're Christians, right? I mean, some of us, I, I always call it Western Christianity or American Christianity. Uh, I'm a Christian because my parents were Christian. Or I'm Baptist. My parents went to a Baptist church, so I think I'm Christian. But being born again is something totally different. Being born again is a, is a new slate. You have changed. That old you is done away with. That new you is walking now with power 
and with hope, with, with the hope of Jesus that he offers. And we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like because when I say those words, I know some of us are going, okay, okay. I think I've been born again, but I don't, what's that power that you're talking about? Well, I hope that we can see it. I hope God's word will do his work in our lives as we read this passage. When I read John chapter 3 as a, as, in fact, I don't even think I was a believer the first time I read it. I was just kind of learning. And when I read the passage, it was very confusing, right? I mean, even for Nicodemus, he was like, uh, time out. That doesn't even make sense to be born again. How can a grown man be born again? And Jesus says several times, he says, you must be born from above. He says that twice. You must be born of water and spirit, and you must be born of spirit. He says several times, and essentially what he's saying, he's using those terms synonymously to kind of say, you must be born of God. You, when John chapter 1 says that God came, Jesus came so that we might have the right to become children of God, not flesh and blood, but children of God. Um, and again, that's what we saw when people profess their faith up here. Um, this is what I call the deep end. When I read this passage, I just think we are now getting into the deep things of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You remember when you were a kid and you were in the kiddie pool for a long time and you always thought about going into the deep end? And when you got there, it was like a rite of passage, even though you were holding the edge the whole time. Like it was still like, dude, I made it. I was in the deep end. You go all the way around, it takes you like 30 minutes and you get all the way back and you're like, I did it. And you, now you have like clout and you got bragging rights, street credit and all, all that. Um, recently even, I was, uh, I was riding my bike through Mount Joy. I'm still trying to get to know the area. And I came across uh, the Mount Joy pool, um, that old ruin. Um, I was, uh, was kind of disappointed to see it. Tony Beisline and I are actually uh, trying to raise $70,000, I think, to get that <laughs> puppy kicking again. So uh, whenever, whenever you guys want to donate. Um, <clears throat> I drove past and I saw this pool and I just see all this potential. Um, but it's, it's not there. But when I was a kid, I would go to pools like that, right? Some of you probably went to the Mount Joy pool and you know what I'm talking about. Well, this is what I'm saying. The deep end of the faith, it's when the children of God are moved by him. Their spirit has their being in him. They, you're putting all your hope and trust in Jesus and it alters the course of your life. Like Jesus said, the wind blows and you don't know where it's going, but you hear its voice. It's no longer you who are moving, but God who is moving in and through you. You may still wrestle with him, doubting at times, questioning his goodness, chasing comfort instead of enduring the cross. Maybe you're struggling to obey God's laws, but unable to do so at almost every turn. But for those who actively seek their God, God gives them the right to become children of God, having their movement found in him alone. So I want to look at God's spirit. What is God's spirit? Now, many of us know it's the third person of the Trinity, right? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. But we don't talk about the Holy Spirit too often. Why? It's kind of weird, right? Am I wrong? I mean, God, I can kind of make sense of. He created everything. Jesus, I can make sense. He, he came down and he, he died on the cross. We learn that as children. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we go, he lives in us and he moves, right? And I kind of get that sense too because it's vague. It's kind of hard to describe. And even when Jesus describes it, you see the wind and its effects. You hear it. It's kind of hard to tell what it's doing, isn't it? It's kind of cool. So let's look at the Old Testament. I want to look at the Old Testament real quick. I just kind of want to run down what's the history of the Spirit? What was the Spirit of God doing in the Old Testament? That is impossible to see. <laughs> Who made those slides? <laughs> Yikes, I apologize. I will do my best to uh, read that myself. Uh, in the Old Testament, I'm going to butcher this, but the Hebrew word is ruach. 
Did I say that right? Anybody? Okay, no one can fact check me? All right. <laughs> it's R-U-A-K-H is how I have it written there, ruach. And the meaning is wind or breath, energy, life. So in Genesis chapter 1, God's spirit is hovering over the formless void and it begins to create. I love this because it's God's own breath that is creating. And as we know, God said, let there be light. And as if his own breath, his own spirit has the ability to make that happen. And so God creates His spirit creates. And not only that, when he makes man from the dust, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. So ruach is this word that is, it's it's life, it's vitality, it's energy, it's doing something. It's pretty cool. But now here's what's happening, and this always fascinated me. So if you are a, if you have been a student of the Bible for any length of time, this has probably caught your eye too. The spirit in the Old Testament seems to hopscotch around, doesn't it? It's at first the second point there, which you cannot see, uh, says God's spirit is with Joseph. Pharaoh says, who is like Joseph where God's spirit is with him? And Joseph can interpret dreams. He can see things that other people cannot see. He hears a dream, and then he tells you what it means. We see this also with Daniel. Daniel can not only tell you what the dream means, he can tell you what you dreamt. That's a different type of power. That's incredible. That's in the book of Daniel. That's a really great story. Um, But that's what God's Spirit does. It goes to Joseph, and Joseph can interpret dreams. And then it goes... uh, Bezalel. I hope I'm saying that right. God's spirit is with a man named Bezalel. And this is a man who has skill, carpentry, masonry. masonry. (laughs) Uh, He is someone who has skill. And God's spirit gives him power to construct and lead others in building the tabernacle for God. Really cool things. Um, The next person is Joshua. Joshua is a man who gets endowed with this spirit, this ruach, God's, I'm probably saying that weird, ruach, I don't know. But God's spirit then comes to Joshua, and Joshua can now lead. We see this also with others. Uh, We see it with the judges who are leading Israel. We see it with the prophets, God's, uh, God's messengers. Probably the most famous and probably one that came out to your mind is Saul, King Saul. And this one's a little puzzling. It's puzzling for me. Where God's spirit rests on a man named Saul and he becomes king. And then Saul is just a divided man. He has so much potential but doesn't take it. And then God's spirit leaves Saul and then rests on David, King David. It's a very interesting thing that we see in the Old Testament. It seems to be that God's spirit is almost tangible, as if he's jumping to one person and then to the next, but he's working in such a way that he's planning out history. I hope that makes sense for you. The way that I understand it, too, uh, this, this helps me understand it. When I think of God's temple, that's where God dwelled with his people. And I just think of God's spirit being in that temple among his people, God dwelling with man. That'd be a cool, cool deal. If there was a place I could go knowing God's going to be there, I want to be there. I want to be there. Psalm 51. I don't know if I have this on the next slide or not. Hey, we can read it. Um, Psalm 51, a little context to this psalm. Uh, David just did something horrendous. He has that incident with Bathsheba. And then he has Bathsheba's husband killed. It's a terrible scene. It's a terrible tragedy in scripture. Um, But this right here is why David is a man after God's own heart, even in the midst of such uh, sin, terrible sin. He says this. I love this passage. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. 
Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And what David, David kind of summarizes, sum, I'm speaking in cursive, hold on. David summarizes that, sorry, John, I broke you there. Um, David is summarizing kind of this idea of what God's spirit can do. If we trust fully in God and rest in him, God's spirit is alive, active, and available for me. But it also seems in the Old Testament that that Holy Spirit can come and go. That would keep me on my toes. If that were true today, that, that scares me a little bit. What was God doing in the Old Testament with this ruach, this spirit, this wind, this energy that was mapping out history and doing things? Well, look, let's look at the New Testament real quick. <laughs> on another slide you cannot see. Um, in the New Testament, the word is, it's different, but it means the same. And the word in Greek is pneuma where we get, I think, the word pneumonia, probably, right? So pneuma. We, start, we first see God's Spirit work with a young lady named Mary, right? We know this story. I know it's not Christmas, but let me, uh, let me kind of catch you up. Mary is visited by Gabriel, the angel, and Gabriel says, God's Holy Spirit is going to rest upon you. And we know where the story goes from there. Mary gives birth to a young man named Jesus, and then when Jesus is older, he is then baptized and God's spirit rests on Jesus. And now, okay, that's following the Old Testament pattern, right? The Holy Spirit is coming and it's, it's doing things within history. But then it starts to get a little bit more personal. God's spirit is then promised to Jesus' disciples. Jesus promises the disciples that the Spirit will come to you and you will have power when the Spirit does. Jesus at one point, I think this is weird, especially in the day uh, that we're in today, but Jesus breathes on his disciples. No mask or anything. <laughs> Jesus just breathes on his disciples, almost mirroring the, uh, the creation narrative, right? Right? Jesus is now beginning to create something new. He breathes on his disciples, and all his disciples are like, what? And then, uh, I'm kidding, I don't know what they did. But the Spirit then ignites the early church. Right when you get into Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, all of a sudden the disciples are speaking in tongues. They are speaking other languages, and everybody can understand them. People are coming to Jesus left and right, the church just blows up. The whole, the whole area in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas are about to witness something beyond belief. Jesus is still being preached, even though that guy died. But did he really die? Jesus rose again, and his spirit is alive, it's active, and it's available for everyone who's believing in him. And we see this not only with the Jewish nation, but it's true for everybody. All those who are Jewish or non-Jewish, the Spirit, God himself, is available for everyone who believes. That's good news, especially for someone like David, who is having a hard time wrestling with, God, I sinned grievously. Don't take your spirit from me. That's a powerful prayer. And the promise in the New Testament is it's going, God is saying, I'm going nowhere. Put your faith and hope in me. I'm going nowhere. Which is good news and scary news if you love your old life because God takes that old life, gets, gets rid of it. You get a new life. You start walking in power, but you have to wrestle because all those things you truly loved have been ripped from you and it hurts. And what I mean by that is our sin nature is being ripped from us, and it hurts. Um, we could go on. Uh, God's Spirit gives us life. We see that in Titus, uh, in the book of Titus. God's Spirit sanctifies us. It makes us holy little by little. We see that in Galatians, in the book of John, and others. God's Spirit secures us. 
We now have the assurance that God is going to be with us when our faith is in him. God's spirit is now available to all who believe and his spirit is gently and sometimes not so gently drawing us ever closer to himself. There's a passage in the Old Testament. uh, It's in Ezekiel. And this was talked about beforehand. In the book of Ezekiel, this promise was already coming. When the Spirit was working in the Old Testament, it was just working out a plan. God was working out a plan, and he was letting us know little by little what he was doing. So in Ezekiel, we kind of get a little taste of what God was planning to do, and this was before Jesus came. God says, I will, sprinkle, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful, careful to obey my rules. God talked about this right from the beginning. Uh, William Barclay, uh, Scottish uh, uh, scholar, says this. The spirit-controlled life, the Christ-centered life, the God-focused life, is daily coming nearer, coming nearer heaven even when it is still on earth. It is a life which is such a steady progress to God that the final transition of death is only a natural and inevitable stage on the way. It is like Enoch who walked with God and God took him. As the child said, Enoch was a man who went on walks with God and one day he didn't come back. Woo. Wow, man, there's so much, so much I have to say, even stuff that I didn't write down. But you're probably wondering, Keith, uh, what does this have to do with the book of Romans? I know you were thinking it. Come on, I'm so glad you asked because it's right here in my notes. Oh, you guys are awesome. So Romans chapter 8. Since I've been up here, uh, it's been about a year, we've been going through the book of Romans, and we've only made it to Romans chapter 8. And I know you guys have been reading through the book of Romans on your own as we prepare for each sermon that I'm about to preach. I know it. I know you guys already know the book inside and out. Um, then you probably know that Romans chapters 9 through 11 are heavy, heavy texts. So we're going to spend the next year in Romans 8. Because I'm afraid. Uh, I'm kidding. Romans chapter 9 through 11 is really, a, I love the passage. Um, but Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Um, let me read that for you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I'll end with this. From my experience walking with Jesus, um, I think I've noticed a couple things among uh, my friends and people I've met. There are a handful of different types of people when it comes to their thoughts on Jesus. You get the group who's all in, right? We had that group up here who proclaimed and professed to you, I'm all in. Put me in the water. I want to identify with Jesus' death and raise to life and identify in his resurrection. You have those groups of people who are, I'm in. I'm following him. That was me when I was 15. When I first heard Jesus' message, when I first read the Bible, I was like, it's kind of confusing. I don't really get it. But over time, I was like, man, I'm in. This is it. This is the most, most important conversation, and I want to be a part of it. That's how I felt. And then we have the other camp, right, who want nothing to do with it. 
at the word, even the name Jesus is like, I don't want to hear it. I have a lot of people that in my life now who I know like that, and I still love them. You're allowed, we live in America, you have the freedom to believe what you want, that's fine, that's okay, I'm still going to love you. I still have the freedom to pray for you, boom, so I just pray for him. <laughs> kidding, I'm kidding, but I, it's an incredible thing, and then, so you have the one camp, I'm all in, you got the one camp, I'm all out, and then you have this middle camp, right? Which, again, it was like me when I was first hearing the, the Bible, uh, I don't know, I still have a lot of questions. What about contradictions in the Bible? Can you answer that for me? What about, I mean, even the spirit in the Old Testament is confusing to me, and I don't, I don't even know if I want to start looking into it. It's just kind of weird. Well, I'll tell you, if you're in here today, and that's you, and you're just going, ah, I don't know, maybe God, maybe not. It's just a matter of time, man. Just a matter of time. Even the sloth made it to the ark somehow. <laughs> God, God has you. He's just bringing you in. I believe it. In fact, I know somebody in my life uh, just recently. In fact, I had this conversation yesterday. Um, I didn't get permission to share this story, so I won't give too much detail. But somebody that I know, um, every time we talk, for some reason, religion is brought up and sin is brought up. It's kind of one of those conversations where it's like, well, I do this and I party over here and I do this, but I know you're religious, so I, don't, like, I know you don't like all that. All right. I get, no, I get it. I understand that. But then I just had a conversation yesterday with this person. And they introduced me to a friend and they said, you'll like this friend. They started bringing me to church and I just feel so welcome there. And they love me and they added me on a group chat and they just say, I'm, I'm in. And I'm like, told you, you're in. They're just, God's pulling you in. I just, I hear that and I just go, man, that's it. That's it. Even the most hardened heart only the Spirit of God can do that. I could preach until I'm blue in the face. It means no good if you don't allow God to come into your heart and do some work. That has to happen. And look at me. I'm hearing the words that I'm saying right now. This is true for me too. It's true for me behind this pulpit it is, as it is true for you behind the pew. I need to hear this message. I need to preach this message to myself every day because I still have a sinful nature. I still have thoughts that I wrestle with. We know Pastor does. He's already brought it up a couple times, right? Right? <laughs> Just trying, I'm trying to get all that focus over here if you don't mind. Um, but yeah, I'm a mess. And I still need Jesus. And that's the beautiful, that is the beautiful message of the cross. No matter how much of a mess you are, no matter how many mistakes you've made, or maybe you continue to make, you still have the opportunity to come back to Jesus. And that spirit, his spirit is alive, it's active, and it's available to you. That's a sweet deal. That's a sweet deal. Um, there are days where I wish that I knew the gravity of that deal. I hope this morning that you feel the gravity of it. I know we looked at slides we can't read, but I truly hope that when you hear God's word, you say, amen, I want that. If you've already been born again, you're, you're in here saying, I've heard this message a thousand times. I get that. Sometimes it can seem dull. But that, of, that spirit is still available. Still available. And you know what it takes? Just walk. Go for a walk. Call someone you haven't talked, in a while, talked to in a while, and you'll feel that again. I know the feeling comes and goes, but that faith still has to be there. You still have to choose to go, go for a walk. We have this freedom to grow, and Christ died in our place, and in him, we also lay down our lives so that we might have life in his name. Just like the seed that has to die in order to give life, we also have to lay down our lives so that we might have life in his name. And when we do that, when we identify with his death and his resurrection, we enter into this deep end of faith. According to his promises and his word, God moves in and through his church. That's you, right? By the spirit that's at work in you. And pastor has been going on about this for two months now. Over and over and over again. We are the church. It's not this building. We are the church. When we allow the spirit to move in and through us, this is the spirit of the church. 
moving in and through us. It's God himself. So how can we do that? Let me give you a couple quick ways that we can do that. VBS is coming up. TJ already said we need volunteers. Sign up. VBS is so much fun. If you want to feel alive again and maybe possibly break a hip, join VBS because I know I'm going and I'm going to be sore the next week. But I would encourage you to sign up for VBS if you have the time, the energy to do so. There's also a family fun night. This one's easy. It's a family fun night. Show up, right? I think there's a, a, an illusionist or something. There's, okay, there's going to be sorcery. Great, show up. So I, uh, I would encourage you to go there. But also, Vicky and I were talking about this. This is a great opportunity to invite a friend, Right? Inviting a friend to church sometimes feels weird. Hey, man, come on. We're going to stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, and sing songs. Like, <laughs> it's hard to invite someone to that. But when you, when you say, hey, there's a family fun night. There's going to be sorcery. Uh, don't say that part. There's, there's going to be an, an illusionist. Like, there's going to be something really cool. Invite someone to that. And just like that friend I was talking about, you never know what it might do in their lives. They might just go, man, no one's invited me to anything in a long time. And I've been wrestling with work. And you invited me to this? Thank you. I will be there. Great opportunity. Um, Rainbow's End is looking for backpacks and school supplies. That's an easy one, too. If you have a whole bunch of stuff lying around, you have until the end of the month to get things over to Rainbow's End. That's an awesome opportunity there. Call somebody. Encourage someone. Reach out. Pray for your neighbor, your coworker, your government. Pray for those, maybe even if you don't like them. Maybe if you don't get along, pray for them. And lastly, like Pastor said, all of this, we connect. We connect with the church, we connect with the community, and we connect with Christ. I'm keeping you over, over time here, and I'm still waiting for these plants to grow, so let's just, <laughs> I don't think it's happening. Let's, let's pray. Father God, we love you. Lord God, we, uh, we thank you for your word. I pray that your word would do its work in our lives and that your spirit would just nudge us. Lord, I pray that your spirit would uh, just, um, just move us throughout the week, Lord. May it encourage us to, to chase after you, to find you, to seek you. And Lord, sometimes you feel distant. I get that feeling, Lord. But God, uh, help me, help us to combat those lies, Lord. You are not distant at all. In fact, you are available to each one of us. So help us strive after you. Lord, I pray for those who have given their lives to you, who have laid it down so that they might have life in you. Lord, may they be revitalized by your spirit once again. And Lord, I pray for those who just, either they're on the fence, they're not sure, or maybe they just want they just don't want anything to do with you. God, I pray that they would recognize that, Lord, um, there's only one end to this story, Lord. We're all on our way out. So, God, I pray for those that they would truly see that laying down their lives is the best option that they have so that they might have life in you. Anyway, Lord, we love you. Help us to love you more this day and help us to be more like you more often and with more people. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand and sing.
His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Before we pray, uh, Sunday school will probably start around 10.30, so stick around. God is good. I know the guy that prepared the message, the Sunday school message, and he also used Romans 8, 1 through 4 in the very end. So God is working in this community. Uh, please stick around, so join with me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful country that we live in. Thank you for Pastor Keith and, and uh, his message this morning, Lord. Uh, we remind us of the plan example. Grow in us, Lord. Let us die to self first. And, and Lord, let us be born again like a new slate. Lord, we just ask also that your spirit remains in us. Don't depart. Lord, we, we thank you again for this country, this, this people, and this church. Now I ask... Uh, provide safety and safe travels as folks go to see relatives and loved ones today. And I ask it all in your name. Amen. Amen. For spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains. Above the fruit and plain, America, America, God shed His grace on me and crown Thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea.